Hi everyone, Megan here from Romance by the Book with the lovely Marielle. Hello. And today our amazing guest is New York Times bestselling author Sarah McLean, the Hi. author of our September book of the month bombshell, which we love so much. <gasps> Yay, okay. thank you guys. Thanks oh, for good. Good job, Marielle. <laughs> I should have a copy of it somewhere, but I don't. So, thank oh, you should so I pop it longer? Here. That's it. That is the that is the book. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes, you got the hardcover too. Fancy. I do. Do you have the I don't have hardcovers. Well, I got the hardcover because well, I have been waiting for Cecily and Caleb since 2007 or 17, <laughs> whatever it was. Whatever was you thought of her. A long time ago. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I, lo- I saw them on page together. I guess it was in Day of the Duchess and was immediately like, hi. What's happening with them? <laughs> have more of that, please. Uh-huh. <laughs> no, me too. I was like, what's happening with them? Yes. And then so. the bare knuckle bastards came and I was like, wait. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> I know. <laughs> it wasn't intended to go that way, but you know, things happen. Life happens. Yeah. yeah. But I can't complain. It's not like I didn't like that series. <laughs> it's just. Well, the truth is that Cecily and Caleb, had you gotten them before now, you would have gotten a novella. So mm. you got more. I'll be happy. What I will yeah. tell you. Oh, so great. patience is a virtue is what you're trying to teach me. <laughs> that is, that is the rule of living in the McLean universe. Yes. For everyone, including my editor. So that's funny. Well, um, this was the first time that we've, re- I think it's the first time that we've read a book where I had read like all the books and followed <laughs> all the things. <laughs> and Megan was like, I haven't read any Sarah McLean. So this was your this was first, first Megan. Yeah. <laughs> well, I hope you enjoyed it and were yes, able to follow. Yes, I loved follow. it. It was great. I mean, it was designed to be the first, but the trick with writing your 15th when you write a world like mine, where every book is somehow, I mean, it's all in the same world, mm-hmm. um, is striking that balance between um, making sure new readers don't feel like they have no idea what's going on and yeah. Um, making sure that old readers still feel like, or long-standing readers still feel as though they've, um, they're getting the all the little glimpses that yeah. give them joy. Yes, yeah. it was great. We had a great time reading it. Yeah, Megan didn't have any questions, and I had very much. Did you see? Did you see them? <laughs> <laughs> Megan's like, who are they? I don't care. <laughs> <Important people. laughs> um. It was fun. It made our discussion group fun because, yeah, there was a lot of other people who were somewhere in between having read some, but not all. Some had read all. Some had read. I don't think there's anybody else who hadn't read at least one except for me. But there was a, mm. one who had only read, I think, like, the last series. And then, so. yeah, someone had only read Nine Rules to Break. And they oh, were like, yeah. should I read all the rest of them? And I was like, yes, yes. immediately. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I'm glad that person came back to me. So been a long yeah. time since nine rules no they had recently read it oh okay and then we're like should I read them all leading up to this or should I and I was like you've got time just <laughs> do it it's pandemic that's what that's what pandemics are for Take three reading all the books. Job. Um, well your series are all kind of tied together with um series arcs like there's a there is a you can read each book as a standalone but when you read them all together you tend to get like this payoff because there's a thread that kind of goes through all the books and usually that thread also kind of ties the main characters of each book together Mm -hmm. do you usually decide the group first or do you usually decide the thread first it's always the group first okay um It's always the group first because I am a character first writer. Plots come Mm -hmm. (laughs) very secondary for me, (laughs) which is um, maybe a little bit of a surprise because my books do tend to have sort of twisty, turny plots. Um, I think that's largely because I don't plot my books. So there's always a kind of, now what happens? Let's open the document and just see. Um, the So yes, all of the series, well, the first series, Nine Rules, what what is called Love by Numbers, that first series, the 9, 10, 11 books, those are connected by family. So that's mm-hmm. easy. Um, and they don't really have a, I guess even then you could sort of see the seed of 
my instinct to always have something happen in the third I mean, book mom. or in the last book that has impacted the other books. Um, yes, the mom in the first series. Uh, the casino series was obviously connected by these four fallen aristocrats. Mm-hmm. Um, the Scandal and Scoundrel series was originally conceived as a thematic series, meaning each book would tackle what I wanted to do was take modern celebrity scandals, things that were in, you know, People magazine, <laughs> um, and then put them, set them down in region pre Victorian London. Um, and in the first book, I invented these sisters who were, you know, very loosely based on the Kardashian sisters at the time. And then um, there's, and then I sort of said, okay, well, (laughs) now I have these sisters. And obviously if you put a family on the page, you have to marry them all off. Uh, So we did that. And, and, but Lily is sort of in there in the middle and she's not a sister because I wanted to write a book about somebody who didn't have community um, Mm -hmm. and, uh, so that was all, that was sister friends and then, uh, bare knuckle bastards obviously is very linked in yeah. a way that I had never done before. Um, I mean, it was almost like a fairy tale premise because it was so like, I mean, yeah, one I mean, day, yeah, once upon a time, once. four babies <laughs> were born at the same hour at the same minute on the same day, like that's what I wanted it to feel like. Um, and mm-hmm. Wicked in the Wallflower is a retelling of Rumpelstiltskin. So um, the so that fairy tale thing ended up sort of threading through the whole series. And now Hell's Bells, which Why is obviously said that? Very... Now I have to reread Wicked in the Wallflower because I don't think I caught the Rumpelstiltskin. And I only know one other author who I've even heard talk about doing that particular fairy tale as a... Retelling. You know, I think Rumpelstiltskin is real hot. <laughs> <laughs> Not Rumpelstiltskin, the character, but there's something very, you know, surprising. No one, the idea of somebody, you know, sneaking into your room at night and helping you <laughs> be awesome at the thing that you fix the thing that you said you could do yeah. um, is very hot to me. And so I've always been kind of surprised that no, there have been fewer, I, you would think that beauty and the beast, obviously beauty and the beast works very well in romances. Mm -hmm. Um, We've seen a lot of retellings of beauty and the beast and of, you know, Cinderella, but, um, you know, Rumpelstiltskin, he has a lot of power. And so, you know, if he weren't a troll person, I feel like we would. (laughs) (laughs) So, um, that kind of leads into my question, which is speaking of the ladies for hell's bells, um they all have very particular skill sets and um I guess you might have answered this already by saying you always write the character first but I'm I was so curious if you knew the type of skills that you needed for this to work and figured out which one of them those skills were most appropriate for or did you conceive the characters and they already had these skills and you were like let's make this work a a little of both I think so I knew I wanted I knew right away that it was four. Um, I don't know why it's four, honestly. I mean, it's four because there are four of them now, but they're right from the start. I was like, I'm going to do a girl gang. There are going to be four of them. And um, knowing that there would be ancillary bells, there would be, you know, I think now at the end of Bombshell, there are there are maybe seven that are on the page. Mm-hmm. No, there are not because Nick and Nora are on the page too. So there are like nine on the page. Um, but the, 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 the main four I knew, and I knew obviously it's a romance. So there's a big Duke at the end, right. Who is Duchess. So she's right. the, um, the one who rules them all. <laughs> and, um, and I knew there was, so then I started thinking about other kind of famous bands of 
heists. I really love a heist movie. I love anything where beautiful people blow things up. So I started watching a lot of movies where beautiful people blow things up. I watched a bunch. I watched all the Oceans movies again. I watched the Thomas Crown Affair. I sort of did all of that. Did you watch and the I, Italian Job? Oh, I isn't the Italian one. Job the best? <laughs> so yes. good. So fun. So in each of these, there there are archetypal roles, right? There's the bombshell, the the femme. I mean, in women, right? It's the femme fatale, but for men, it's like the hot guy who can, you know, distract make anybody swoon. <laughs> and then um, there's, you know, the the thief, the one who can, you know, pick a lock or, you know, steal a thing or crack a safe or whatever Italian job style. Mm -hmm. And then there's the one who's slightly mad, right? Just a, just a touch off center. <laughs> um and then there's the one who ha loves it when a plan comes together. Mastermind. Mm -hmm. And the idea was that there would be these kind of archetypal figures. Um, and I had thought a lot, I, I'm going to date myself, but um, when I was a kid, Mr. T was huge and he was in the A-team. Yeah. Um, so I watched the movie version of the A-team, which has Liam Neeson and Bradley Cooper in it. And it's really like so delightfully much fun. fun. I have never I've heard of it. It's, it's really fun. Super bananas. Yeah. And you just, I mean, it's not like the greatest plot you've ever watched, <laughs> but, but it's, so it's fun. super fun. And it has, and I remember kind of thinking like, this is, these are the archetypes, right? The, and, and they really are in the A team. There's like the one who can do anything. The one who, you know, it's crazy, is a little the one bit who is wild, beautiful. the yeah. one who's beautiful and the one who has it all together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Literally quote, it loves it when a plan comes together. Right. Um, so I just was, so that was the idea. And yeah. then it was kind of like, okay, these are the four archetypes. How did they all come to be? And so you'll see, you'll meet, you know, you meet Cecily at the moment. She's like summoned to the bells. You'll meet Adel you meet Adelaide at the moment she's summoned to the bells and, and that'll happen for each of them. So you'll know, you'll see their like quick origin moment at the beginning. Okay. And then you're dumped into what I hope feels a little bit like a Bond movie in the sense that um, I, I literally was just looking at the early, the first few chapters of the next book, which is Adelaide's book and thinking about it as cinematic. I think of all of my books pretty cinematically. And so I, the idea of a cold open, a kind of, you're going to see, you see Adelaide's book begins with the job that came before the job that is happening over the course of Adelaide's book. And okay. So the idea being, you know, it's like the moment when Pierce Brosnan like jumps off a cliff and catches a plane midair, right? Which is nonsense, but you love it. And I mean, I love that. Yeah. So yeah. we're really just, we're leaving all, <laughs> everything behind. And just these four women are about to rule the world. So awesome. Which is all I want. <laughs> I would love to live in a world where those four women ruled. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Um, I was going to ask you next. Um, there are several moments in this story specifically where, um, you call out kind of the bystander effect and how so many, um, people will allow bad things to happen just so that they won't be the one who spoke up or who, to get singled out that way. Was that deliberate, like a deliberate commentary on some of the events of the past couple of years, or is it something that's just in been in your head longer wait I'm sorry you cut out as part of that you cut out after you said oh. bystander can we I'm sorry can we no just... you're fine fine I also, heard you my say dog it, was groaning the, in the background no it was so. my computer got all weird and then you were choppy so you said bystander effect and then yeah and just kind of how people allow bad things to happen will allow bad things to happen to somebody kind of in full like there's in this, this story you've got kind of open secrets and also people being treated badly in, in, yeah, the in front of a whole room full of people and nobody is like up to the challenge of being the one that steps up yeah was that a deliberate commentary on like current events or things that have been happening in the last few years or just I mean I think I don't know that it was deliberate but it I mean the one scene that I'm thinking of is a scene where a woman is just desperately 
poorly treated by her husband. And everybody in the room kind of knows that he's a terrible dude and she probably shouldn't have been allowed to marry him to begin with, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, and no one says anything. And it just, it's heartbreaking that moment where, and we've all been there. We've all been, we've all been bystanders and said nothing. We've all been the person who's been ill-treated and had no one say anything. Mm -hmm. And a lot of us have been the people who have said, hey, stop, what are you doing, right? Um, and then and cut I, down to size because like, how dare you? <laughs> yeah. And then yeah. told like, oh, you stepped in. You shouldn't have said you that. Overstep. That's yeah. yeah. You shouldn't have said that you, this wasn't your place. Right. Um, and I think that over the last couple of years, I've been thinking a lot about uh, like many of us, I've been thinking a lot about um, how hard it is for so many of us to say, Hey, stop that. You know, you're, you are not acting you are not behaving well, right? And mm-hmm. to name the problem, the problem being whatever the problem is, like it can be as much as you're being like, that was a root, that was rude. What you just said was rude. I mean, I have a seven-year-old. So like, sometimes I have yeah. to say like, Hey, <laughs> that wasn't very nice. Right. Yeah. Um, but also to grown people who should know better. And I mean, we're living in a pandemic right now. Right. And we're all seeing just, it feels like we're seeing the best and worst of the world. Mm-hmm. And for me, I, and I think it's, it's like sometimes manifests itself in hot rage, but the, but I try to to have it manifest itself in something productive and just to name it, right. To say like, Hey, that's, you know, that's sexism, that's racism, that's homophobia. You know, the things that you are saying hurt people and maybe you don't mean to, but that's what's happening. Um, and in that particular moment, somebody had to stand with that woman who honestly, when it happens in front of other people, it's like the worst because Mm -hmm. you feel like, am I crazy? Like none of these people are saying anything. Um, and it feels like the whole world is gaslighting you in a lot Mm -hmm. of ways. Um, and I wanted to articulate that and I wanted to show that it just, um, we all need to think about how other people are being treated in front of us, which is, I think what hell's bells, what the bells are doing, right. They're, they are seeing that women, women particularly, but you know, women, children, marginalized people are not able always to stand. They need people to stand with them. Yeah. Well, and it's really interesting. It was to me anyway, to see the, the difference in response in that scene where Adelaide you know, is like, she hulks out here yeah. and the wallflower, but <laughs> <it's fine. laughs> um, and, and how people responded there versus the very first kind of heist of the story mm. where it was the, like, it was a, an embarrassment and a thing that, um, like opened the door for everybody to like, he, he titter about it that made like actually hurt uh, actually hurt the um the man who was acting acting badly everybody knew he was but nobody would say anything until it could be like gossip or do you know what I mean like it's like so interesting to me it's like yeah it's like watch I live in New York City and every once in a while a video will come will go viral about of somebody you know on the subway saying or doing something bad I mean this is viral videos you know of people saying or doing something bad in the world right Mm -hmm. um and what always fascinates me is it's the person who there's whenever it gets stopped, it's one person stands up, right. And says, you know, stop or whatever. And then instantly more people get up, right. Mm -hmm. There's, it's that moment where the flashpoint is one person just saying like, Hey, that's not okay. And then everybody else, it like breaks, it breaks something in the tension in the room. And then everybody else can also speak up in, in a kind of way. Mm -hmm. Um, in that particular case though, with the first, the, the first scene, obviously like everyone knew this guy was terrible. And I mean, look, I have been a part of the group of people who like knows a guy is terrible in your midst, like not, not terrible, like this guy, but you know, I've, and everyone literally knows like, oh, that guy's cheating on his girlfriend and no one says it. Right. And I appreciate Mm -hmm. that that's 
a tricky situation in real life and it's easier to manage in a book. But um, the, that, that particular man in the first chapter of, of Bombshell, he deserved worse than he got for sure. Um, and the bells could have given it to him, but it was the first chapter. So yeah, <laughs> um, uh, but he he's deserved it. Hold something back. <laughs> yeah, like I couldn't torture him in the first chapter. That would be a different book. Um, he deserved worse than he got. But when he walked into the room, ev- it was like the idea was that everyone would be able to breathe a sigh of relief and like finally be able to acknowledge. Finally, this is open. Yeah, who had wealth and power and title, like, was now a laughing stock, right? Yeah. Um, deservedly. So, you know, it's tricky. I also think, um, with men, like making a man, a laughing stock is a more powerful weapon in a lot of ways than like an insult on a balcony, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, because masculinity yeah, right. And shame. So I don't know. I I've been playing a lot, obviously with this, this series there are there are, I've been thinking a lot about, um, infractions and punishments. Like what, what are the things that harm us and what are the ways that those things should be rectified? Um, and that balance is tricky. And sometimes my editor is like, this feels like torture. (laughs) And sometimes she's like, this could be worse, you know? And it's, you need that kind of push pull from other people to say like, he deserved more and you know, maybe he deserves a little less. Right. I don't know. Cause like, again, hot hot rage, like (laughs) hot rage happens. And I'm just like, you know, my, my daughter is seven, like I said, and you know, sometimes boys do, you know, Mm-hmm. things in school or in camp or whatever and say mean things and I mean girls too but whenever it's a boy I'm like well he has to die <laughs> <laughs> and then my husband's like okay so <laughs> or 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 hear me out <laughs> hang on <laughs> That's funny. I my husband's super like even keel. Yeah. So I do tend to be like burn it to the ground. And he's like, well, <laughs> yes, I understand why you feel this way. However, maybe yes. we should consider right. it. I'm always like, stop right. it with your logic. It's anyway. How yeah, dare but you there I am logic. like in the camp pickup line, like giving a seven-year-old boy a lecture on patriarchy, like <laughs> And Eric's like, yeah, that's torture. That's the right punishment. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's funny. I love it. So um, catching back up with Caleb, our hero, who we loved so very much. I know you said you're basically a pantser when it comes to like plotting. So did you know Caleb's whole story back when he was first on the page? Or did that all come up when you were writing his book? No, I did not. Longtime McLean fans will know that often my heroes have secrets that don't come out until about three quarters of the way through the book. Yeah. And that is a surprise to all of us. When that <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, oh, there it is. He's not American. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what? Yeah, we actually talked what about that in our recap for that week because Marielle was like, she's like, when he... Um, you know, there was other things where I was like, oh, Cecily's overreacting. And then it was that he wasn't American. And I was like, what? <laughs> you had two surprises kind of back to back. And the first one I was like, yeah, I knew. And then I was like, what? <laughs> and then I like flashed back. This is terrible. I did. This is how I read. I like flashed back to all the times or an earlier time when she was like, haha, you almost sound British or haha, this is whatever. And I was like, <laughs> Well, that's, see, that's the benefit of like draft. And like, I have said, my, I'm on the record as saying my drafts are garbage and no one ever believes me, but I promise they are. And then revision is the whole ball game for me. Like everything that is good in a book of mine happened in revision guaranteed. And so what happens is it's 75% of the way through the book when you realize, I mean, I did know the first twist, like that's kind of, that was an obvious thing that, you know, I knew that right away, but, um, the set when it, when it becomes clear that he's not an American and I was like, Oh, he's not an, Oh, <laughs> and then, and then I was like, I have to go back and fix it. And it was actually really interesting because 
as I had been writing it, um, I've never written an American hero. And um, my editor at one point circled something when they were in the closet, maybe, or something that Caleb says. Mm -hmm. And she was like, um, in the draft. And she was like, this doesn't sound American. Like he sounds British here. And I was like, okay. And so then I went back and I was like, oh, look, all it's like, it doesn't matter as much. Like now it's like, oh, she meant to do it. (laughs) (laughs) So here we are. (laughs) You're learning all my secrets. Um, but no, yeah. Once then, once you hear that, then all of those moments when Cecily is like, careful, you almost sound English. Like yeah, I was like, she's a genius. Like a little hint. Yeah. She told me and I didn't even know it. Someone else was like, I knew Caleb wasn't American from the start. And I was like, well, I didn't. So good for you. I didn't know that one. There was, there was some other stuff where I was like, come on, Cecily, think it through. Like, I see why you're jumping to yeah. this conclusion, but that's not the Caleb we know and love. But then, no. yeah, but that at, other. At one point, I do remember like, Mm, three quarters of the way no it wasn't that way it was in Colford's office because there's a moment when Caleb crouches down it's the thigh moment for those mm-hmm. people who are thigh mm-hmm. sexuals she's like, like I know those thighs yeah she's like his enormous thighs my that's another moment where my editor like circled and was like too much and I was like not enough like <laughs> you're not paying attention to the internet uh citation Henry Cavill so <laughs> but the I, I remember like she he he like crouches down and I was thinking like what's he wearing? And then I was like, oh shit, he's American. What is he wearing? And I called Joanna Shoup and I was like, Joanna, <laughs> what is this man wearing? <laughs> That's awesome. I mean, luckily for men, it's a lot easier. Uh, the fashion was quite similar, but if she, if he, if it had been reversed and she'd been a woman, it would have been a much more difficult task to dress her. Yeah. Good thing that you have friends. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. Joe, I literally didn't has I mean I I should have even tried to google or something. I didn't. I just picked up the phone and called Joanna and I was like, like someone knows. Wearing. Who knows? Like, I Joanna got you. Shoup knows. <laughs> I, know. I don't want to do this homework. <laughs> that signal. Oh, no, exactly. That's why you make friends. <laughs> totally. Oh. Um so I had a scene that I really uh, liked. Actually, it was the scene we were talking about with the bystander effect with Adelaide stepping in and the Duke of Claiborne, uh, who Cecily called her like boring dinner companion, steps up and is like telling her that she overstepped. And I don't know if you can answer this because it might just be part of like their story, but it seemed to me like he was trying to tell her something more like with his inflections and like how he, what the words he chose to say to her and how he said them. And it kind of felt like maybe they, like this was not their first interaction. And I was wondering if you had anything to say about that. I, uh, I will tell you, well, I haven't finished the book. And as you know, I don't plot, so I can't guarantee it wasn't their first reaction, but okay. uh, interaction, <laughs> but as of right now, it is not, it was, it was their first interaction. Okay. Um, but who knows? Who can, I reserve the right to use that idea. <laughs> okay. I don't think actually I will, but I, um, but I'm pretty sure, but I do think that the, um, suggestion that Claiborne, um, like was trying to say something or was aware, more aware of Colford than maybe it seemed is not necessarily an, an incorrect observation. Okay. I, it, to me, he very much seemed like somebody who has a forward facing persona and something else hiding under there. So, yeah, um, I told Andy Christopher the other day that I wanted to use Stern Brunch Duke to, <laughs> to describe Claiborne in, in marketing yes. materials. <laughs> I've been <laughs> allowed. Um, he's a real daddy, honestly. He's my first Love daddy, it. I think. So, um, but very fun to write because he is real buttoned up. Oh, the best. I'm so it's excited. fun with Adelaide who like dissolves into the background. So my, you might assume that she's but more buttoned up than she really is. Yeah. Adelaide, I've always thought of her um, from the very start. At one point, well, well, when I was writing bombshell and I was writing that scene 
and she just <laughs> loses her shit. And I was like, oh, Adelaide's the Hulk. Like, right. Cecily's like the plan, the plan. And she's like, <laughs> nope. No, Hulk yeah. out. Um, and and I was like, oh no, she's Bruce Banner. Like that's her, that's the archetype where like, she's just like unassuming, quiet wallflower until. Until. You don't yeah. want to make her angry. No, yeah. don't ever make, and it's set at, I think I wrote that. I think there's a line in Bombshell where it's like, don't, don't make Adelaide angry. <laughs> and, and, uh, and that's really fun too, because the question is like, when you're writing a character like that, you can't obviously have them fly off the handle all the time. So it's like how long of a fuse and then what happens when it kabooms. Yeah. Right? yeah. Well, it's fun to see too, like how much she would accept as far as like people being mean to her or people being dismissive mm-hmm. of her or any of that. But does that change when it's somebody else? Yeah. And her rage and that- in that, in that scene, her rage isn't it doesn't just come from watching the interaction between the husband and wife it comes from the husband and wife and everyone Everyone else everyone else and nobody else doing anything yeah yeah so and for Adelaide the plan is bullshit if it means leaving someone behind right Mm -hmm. which is that's a good girl gang member you need you need to have people who are like no I'm not you know, I think Duchess would absolutely leave someone behind if it were necessary for the plan. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I yeah. mean, I think she would have like killed Caleb in the first third of the book. <laughs> well, we know Imogen has no chill. We know Imogen cannot be trusted alone with anyone. So. <laughs> but Imogen has fun with her, with her toys. I feel like the Duchess is kind of like, who knows? Also, yeah you know, like, how do we, how do we fix this? I was like, there's this, there's also, there's a line in the early, in the first scene in the place where the Duchess says, like, it's not like it's the first dead body we've had to deal. You know, there's like a moment where I, I certainly think dead that we know now we've read bombshell, right? So we know dead bodies are not, they're not uncomfortable around dead bodies. They just prefer not to leave them in ballrooms. Yeah. (laughs) They don't want them to be rooms that they have recently yeah. been in. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so much fun. All right. Well, um, I have a question that might be hard for you to answer, but I'm going to ask it anyway because okay. I've been told that as a writer, it's important to know your strengths and play to them. So I'm like, Sarah McLean, what do you think <laughs> your strengths are as a writer? I think it, I think my biggest writing strength in the text, I mean, I, I don't know what, I actually don't believe I have a strength in writing in the actual process, the verb to write. <laughs> <laughs> it's always hard. Um, like I am an excellent speller. No, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I know how to use a comma. Um, no, I think my best, the, the best pieces of McLean novels are often set pieces. Um, I think when you walk away from one of my books, you have a real sense of place and, um, you have a memory of a location often more than, I mean, hopefully you have memories of characters and, you know, other stuff too. But, um, I think, of I think like the casino in, in, uh, the rules of scoundrel series and, um, the rooftops in bare knuckle bastards and, um, the in this in the uh, hopefully the place here and the ballroom um where they the duchess's ballroom i think these are these are moments these are places that will stick with you i think i hope as readers and so for me i think it's always setting um which is a surprise because i don't think about the books that way at all but i sort of naturally like to center my books with you know big set pieces mm-hmm. Yeah, that is cool. That's cool. And I do remember places probably for all the <laughs> days, so yeah. And um, I think, well, yeah, there's like the underwater ballroom. Like there are moments mm-hmm. where certainly when I talk to readers, often readers are like, I love that scene in this place. Yeah. Um, and there's, and cool, there's lots of little bits where it's like, oh, yeah, I think that's a really good question, though, because I um, when I think about other writers, writers who I admire often it is a, for example, I think Lisa Kleypas always puts what I 
refer to as like a talisman in her books, mm-hmm. right? There's always an item that holds more meaning than anything else. And yeah. Um, she does that so beautifully and in the hands of less deft authors, I think those items can often feel cliched, um, but Lisa can do it so well. Um, so yeah, I think that's a great question. Thanks. So we have a couple questions we always ask, uh, everyone we talk to, and mm-hmm. mine is what is your favorite trope to read? I guess we probably know the answer since you have a podcast about it. But. No, it's actually not Fated Mates. It's ironically, <laughs> ironically, I never, I don't, I never really loved Fated Mates um, so until fun. I read Cressley and I was like, oh, wait a second. I like, like this. This is what this is like. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, it's, it's enemies to lovers. It's okay. anything where two people are just like dialoguing on the page and you just feel like they might kiss or they might murder, do yeah. crime. <laughs> So it's enemies to lovers, but, um, I really, I mean, when you're talking about smaller tropes, I really love, um, I am, I know it's problematic, but like, I'm a sucker for older brother's best friend. That's my favorite trope. That's my all time favorite trope. I always good. And I know it's like, I know that I it's, I'm so basic, (laughs) but I love it. I really do. Great. (laughs) That's funny. I think my favorite is like what I'm reading at the time. I yeah. change it so much. I'm always like, I love this is the best. And then yeah. the next one, I'm like, this is the best. Sometimes I think I hate it. And then I read it and I'm like, no, this is actually. Really- yeah. I really like, um, I mean, it's also, it's a, it's a subset of enemies to lovers, but I really like um, revenge books mm, where I do too. And again, surprising no one where like one <laughs> character has to take revenge on the other for you know, romance reasons. reasons. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think I also enjoy, um, like close proximity a lot and in different iterations of that. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, which I think is why I like the, like, um, marriage of convenience sometimes. Cause it's like, they're kind of stuck with each other. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's just good the thing about romance is the hardest thing I think about writing romance is figuring out how to keep them on the page together without keeping them together, without having them be together. Right. They have to be together and also not together at the same time. And that is not easy. It's even harder in contemporary, I think, than historicals. But this is why like road trip works. One, there's only one bed works, like caretaking romance works. And it's because it's just a good Care solid reason together. Right. Caretaking romance always melts my little heart. I know. <laughs> like it just could be a moment in the book and it's that the one. I me. know. I love a sick bed scene. Very much. <laughs> um didn't oh that was the the faded maids episode. Were you sick? And they did a sick bed. I was sick. Okay. And actually Jen and I That's were just right. recording yesterday and um I was sick and Kate Claiborne came in and did sick beds with us with Jen. Sorry, you can see my dog back here. Oh, um, no. But the um, Jen came in. And so Kate Claiborne and Jen did sick bed scenes. And I'm like 90% positive that I had COVID at the time. Um, but it was before it was like the first week of March. It was right when it was hitting New York City and everybody had COVID um, and everything was and fine. And nobody was talking about it yet. Really. Well, there were no tests. Still, like yeah. I remember being on the phone with my teledoc like calling in the right. middle of the night because I was sick and the doctor being like well I'm pretty sure you have COVID but there are no tests so good luck <laughs> like okay you're like that's not terrifying at all Thanks. <laughs> well it was what's weird is at the time it like felt it was so early that it felt like okay I have this thing and I guess I'm just gonna go back to bed but anyway yes they did sick beds um and now I'm fine unlike many people so I'm very grateful it's good. I've been, uh, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stay on topic. My question, (laughs) (laughs) my, my question I usually ask people is if we were a fly on the wall, um, while you're deep in your writing, what would we see? Um, what would you see? You would see, uh, you would see many, many, cans of Canada dry seltzer water <laughs> that are just on my desk all the time. <laughs> I hope you mean literally what you, what yeah. would you see? Yeah. 
Um, lit- just pi- I'm looking at my desk because I am actually pretty deep in the writing process right now. You would see just piles and piles of mess. I'm not a clean space. I'm not a tidy mind writer. Um, tidy space, tidy mind writer. If I, I mean, maybe my drafts would be better if I was, but I literally make, um, I make towers of Schweppes, um, seltzer water cans on my desk. Um, and then, and it has to be the cans. My, like Eric once bought me like a case of the bottles. And I was like, what are these? Like, what are this? <laughs> um, so <laughs> We're you're fired. How very um, fair. I know. Like what? You're messing you with never the process. <laughs> this reminds me of like the sports, uh, like you know, sports players and their um, yeah, like superstitions and yeah, stuff. That's the way yeah. they're superstitions. And when I hit, so um, I don't talk about books until I hit 200 pages on the manuscript because I'm superstitious. But then when I hit 200 pages on the manuscript, I print the manuscript out. And then I print out every chapter as I'm going. It's like, I have, um, yeah, I am a little bit like a superstitious sports person um, because I have like little things that always happen or co- on the, um, as, as it goes. And then I also have, um, and it's underneath a pile of paper, so I'm not going to find it and show it to you, but um, I have, I, my process is 100 words at a time. I'm extremely I'm an extremely slow writer and I need like constant motivation. Um, and what I have found is that if I measure my writing pro- process, 100 words at a time, I have to write 100 words, 1000 times. And then I have a book. Right. And that doesn't, for me, that doesn't sound like a lot. That's like, Oh, that's totally manageable. Right. A hundred words is like a paragraph. Um, and so I measure my um, progress with, a, I have a graph, like a piece of graph paper, and I just like color in a box every time I've, you know, finish a hundred words. And, um, you know, that has like tea stains on it and is gross by the end, but there it is. <laughs> I think you wouldn't like it in my office when I'm deep in the writing <laughs> process <laughs> is my answer. And yeah, so it's just me and you would. And the dog under my desk. So my dog's also always right near me, except for right. Now. I was gonna say I'm surprised. <laughs> Usually she pokes her head in at some point. <laughs> yeah. Mine has an extremely loud bark. And when people walk by on the sidewalk, she likes to bark at them. So she has to go in the bedroom when we record, Aww. or else we would only ever hear her barking. <laughs> I'm like, Georgia, people can walk on the sidewalk. It's really okay. <laughs> <laughs> They're not invading your territory. It's fine. Oh, sweet pea. Yeah, she's. she's well, mine is my my daughter has gone to school today for the first day in eighteen months. So my dog is really tripping. Right now. Oh, he's just walking around. <laughs> Usually, he would be asleep. He's like, where is she? Yeah, he's like, yeah. what? You can see his tail right here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> going. Anyway. Um. I saw a thing on Instagram lately where people are teaching their dogs how to like they have these buttons that say words. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, that would be amazing. But also I'm not sure if I want my dog to tell me. You like, know, snaps from uh snaps from strange love or nothing for me. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I just, I mean, I love him very much, obviously, but I don't think there's much there there. <laughs> So it's just like, I feel it. Sometimes I feel like he just, he can't hear me outside for the wind just blowing through his head. (laughs) My dog um, tries to boss me around. So I'm not sure. (laughs) I think if I gave Kahlo language, it would not be, it would just prove that he's just, there isn't much there, there. He's not, there's, there's very little depth. (laughs) Feel like Old derpy boy. Love yep. it. <laughs> He's very sweet though. So which is all you need. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All right. Well, I guess. Yeah, that pretty much covers everything. Now talked about we, my dumb we dog. Loved the book and we're so grateful we got to read it. Thank, Thank you so you. much for being here with us. Thank you for and having me. All of you out there who are watching this will be watching it on the same day that Sarah will be doing her takeover of our yeah. page. I'm so, so excited. I can't wait. Hi. Hey, where else can they find you on the interwebs? 
You can find me, where can you find me? Well, you can find me at Faded Mates, which is my podcast, which is a romance novel podcast that comes out every Wednesday at midnight Eastern time. Mm -hmm. You can try to beat Marielle to be the first one to listen to the podcast, (laughs) but you probably won't. Um, She gets up at an ungodly hour to go to work. Mm -hmm. And she's always the first one. She's always the one who tells us if it's double speed or or (laughs) weird. Like she's, she's our, she's our beta tester. Um, The, no, it's very useful, especially when I find out I'm married to our producer. And so periodically there will be a tweet from Ariel that's like, you are a chipmunk's feed this week. And I like get to poke him awake at 7 a.m. and be like, <laughs> podcast is at chipmunk speed. Um, so there's that. So you can find me. That's at fadedmates.net or you can just search Faded Mates in your podcasting uh, app. And you can find me on Twitter at Sarah McLean, but I'm there less and less these days because Twitter makes me anxious. Um, so like all of us, um, and I much prefer Instagram, which is at fate of me. No, stop at Sarah McLean. Not at um, you can fo- follow fate of mates there too. Um, I'm also on Facebook. I have a, um, 8,000 person strong romance reading, uh, romance reader community called OSRBC. Um, so just search those letters and you'll find us. I think that's where that's Marielle great. and I talked for the first time, isn't oh, it? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I um, met Cheryl and even more there and all these people that it's been well, really fun. Do you run the writer group? I, well, I don't run it, but I do <laughs> hop in there. I, I'm like, we're going to in there a bit. Yeah. And, and I periodically like disappear because I'm yeah. like, Probably I should write instead of trying to find content. <laughs> yeah. If you're a writer, um, there is a little writing group there. Um, and yeah, that's where you can find me. Those are all the places I think. Yes. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thanks everybody. Thank and we'll see you next month. Bye.